Tonight, we're in chapter 8 here in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 25 as we continue our study here in the Gospel of Luke. And so, what we'll do is we'll be taking verses uh, 16 through 18 together, then verses 19 through 21, and then verses 22 through 25 as we continue our verse-by-verse study in the Gospel of Luke. So, let's begin reading here in Luke chapter 8 at verse 16. I'll read Luke 8 verses 16 through 18, and we'll get into our study. Jesus in Luke chapter 8 verse 16 says, No one when he has a little lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. And therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has to him, more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. And so Jesus gives a parable here, and what he does is he uses a lamp. A lamp is used here to illustrate uh, who we are. Uh, the lamp is used to illustrate our mission in life. Life, And, and his point is, is Christians are to shine brightly in the midst of a sin-darkened world. We're to be the light that is shining brightly in a world that is walking in spiritual darkness. That's our purpose. That's what God intends for us. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so the purpose of the church is to shine brightly, even as the purpose of a lamp is to produce light in a darkened room. You don't get a light and... um, a lamp and, and turn it on, Jesus says, uh, and, then, and then hide it. You don't put it under a bed. You don't cover it with a basket. You uh, light it in order that it might illuminate. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. When we, when we receive the Lord as a Lord and Savior, He intends us to live in such a way that people obviously see that God is alive and working through us. You see, the body of Christ is intended by God to, to reveal the invisible God in the Old Testament Uh, God spoke to the nation of Israel and said to them, you will not have a graven image. You are to carve no object that is to represent me, none whatsoever, because God is the invisible God. The nations surrounding Israel during the time of its inception were pagan nations, and they were idolaters, and therefore they had trees and rocks and various things that they would worship. They would would, uh, carve a a piece of wood into the image of a man, and they would use it as as an idol, and they would pray to it and ask it to deliver them and all of that. And here's the nation of Israel being taken out of uh, Egyptian bondage, and God begins to do a work, and and the Egyptians were flat-out pagan. They were idolaters, and so God gives to them the the Ten Commandments, and within them He says, you're not to make a graven image, you're not to bow down and worship it. I'm the Lord thy God, and I'm a jealous God. And so the nation of Israel is unique in that it is taken out of the midst of idolatry and commanded to worship the invisible God, and that's exactly what they did. God still intends to be worshiped. But God also still intends to communicate His attributes to people, at least those attributes that can be communicated. And so He chooses to do that through a people. We worship the invisible God, but God, in a sense, manifests Himself through our lives. So the invisible God we worship is actually pouring into us through His Spirit, His graces, His gifts, and there are evidences that God exists because His church does the works that bring glory to Him. And so that's what we're called to do. We're called to walk and to work in such a way that God is honored and glorified. So we let our, sh- our light shine before men. That's what Jesus is speaking about. And so what we're to do is to openly uh, manifest the light of Jesus Christ because light is necessary in a world filled with moral darkness. That's what I was taught from the very beginning when I first got saved. I, I was taught, don't put your light underneath a basket. Don't hide it from this world because the world needs to see it. Now, unfortunately, many people are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are quite a number of Christians who are afraid to open their mouth and and to say, I follow Jesus Christ. There are a variety of reasons, I'm sure, for that, but the bottom line is, is they don't. Many Christians just simply don't talk about Jesus. It's it's just, I guess, not too, it's not cool to do that. I guess it's not acceptable to do that. Maybe they're a, a bit ashamed to do that. 
But unfortunately, because Christians aren't speaking forth the truth, well, the world is being enshrouded by a lie. And so Jesus says, listen, you need to make sure that the light shines. Make sure that you're open about your faith. Make sure that people know that you love Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's the power of God into salvation, he was not afraid or ashamed. He didn't shrink back from declaring what God had given to him. He says to the Corinthians, that which I received, I gave unto you, I delivered unto you. Jesus Christ has revealed himself to me, and I'm revealing to you what he has revealed to me. And so he is very open to what, with what the Lord has said to him. And that's what Jesus Christ taught us all along, that we're to live in such a way that, that, we, um, that we shine his light. Uh, we need to remember that darkness is the spiritual condition of every person entering into the, into the world. Darkness, they enter in spiritually dark. Paul said that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. In Ephesians 4, 18, he said, uh, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. And so the condition of every person who enters into the world is that he has no relationship with God and therefore walks in spiritual darkness. So as a lamp, the church is to provide light in the spiritual darkness of the world system. That's what we do. We live as light in a sin-darkened world. In 1 Peter, uh, Peter said it this way in chapter 2, verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so that's what Jesus is speaking about here in Luke chapter 8, verse 16, when he says, no one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. And so as a lamp, we are to provide light in the spiritual darkness of this world system. Now, notice verse 17, he goes, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. People may cover up sin in their lives, and they can do that, but they will always fail in the end because God brings to light every hidden thing, and he judges righteously based on that which he exposes. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, it says, God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So I might think that I got away with something, but ultimately I am aware of the fact that God judges righteously. You know, sometimes we, um, we might watch the news or read a newspaper or magazine, and we read of how somebody seems to get away with some very evil thing. They just don't find the person who did it. Recently, as all of us are aware, there was a little girl who was abducted in Portugal. She has English parents. They were there for holiday, and they went off to eat. And as they were gone, some monster uh, stole their baby. And, and um, you know, and, and I, I hear of that, and, and, and obviously, like you, my... My heart is touched by that. I, I, I am amazed and, and in pain over such a thing. Who would do such a thing? And, and many times the, the, the monster who did that is not found out, this side of, uh, this side of judgment. But, but he will be found out. He will be dealt with, you know. And that ultimately is something that I frankly, I fear on that person's behalf. But I also, I also take peace and comfort in that because the Lord is going to expose every evil thing. The Bible in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 says that God will give to each person according to what he's done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he'll give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. And so Jesus says, nothing is secret that will not be revealed. God is going to put his searchlight on people's lives, and what we may think we're getting away with will be revealed on that day. In verse 18, therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. In the things of the Spirit, a person is always either gaining or they are losing. He's either advancing or he's declining. And when you receive in faith the things of the Lord, your life grows in maturity as well as spiritual experience. 
And as you receive Christ, you have. But as you have received Christ and he's given to you, through your experience, you gain more and more and more. You continue growing in the things of God. You already have, but you're going to be given more. You see, every blessing is a taste of future blessings and experience in Jesus Christ. So we grow in grace and we grow in the experience of the things of God. So you get saved, we'll say, 10 years ago, and as you walk with the Lord for 10 consecutive years and you do so in a faithful way, well, you've been growing over the 10 years and you know more and more of the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when I first got saved a few years ago now, when I first got saved, um, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't pronounce some of the books of the Bible. I had no clue, you know, how to say Ecclesiastes and things like that. You know, I, I thought the book of Job was Job. I mean, what do I know? And, uh, and seriously, and so I, I would read the Bible, and, and I didn't understand 99% of what I was reading. Now, over the years, I've gained a little understanding and experience in the things of the Lord, and, and so I've grown, and that's what happens with you too. You add to it. You add to your faith. You add to your understanding. You add to the things of the Lord. And as you do so, you continue to advance in the things of God. Why? Because you received Christ, and you began your walk with the Lord. And over the weeks and months into the years, you continue to advance. And so, you continue to grow in those things. And that's what the Lord would have for you. Whoever has to him, more will be given. And yet, if you don't open up in faith... You're not going to receive anything, but you do eventually lose everything. It's been said zero plus zero always adds up to zero. And so no, tr no trust in God, so you progressively grow colder to the gospel. You, you might have begun at one point considering things of the Lord. You may at one time have thought, I wonder and all, but when you don't act on that, it just eventually just, it just, it's gone. You know, I... I've had people say in the past, they've said, you know, it's such a blessing to see young kids get saved. What a miracle. It's always a miracle when somebody gets saved, always. And we always rejoice when somebody gets saved. There's no doubt about that. But the greater miracle is when an older person gets saved because they've had an entire lifetime of hardening to the gospel of Jesus Christ, an entire lifetime of experience that has actually uh, led them away from him. And so when I see people who are older committing their hearts to Jesus Christ, to me that is a tremendous, a tremendous miracle. But if you begin in your walk with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you grow. If you resist and refuse him, then ultimately... There's no advancing for you. You only are regressing. Moving into verse 19. Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Now, what an interesting passage there. Jesus is teaching in a in a, a home in the city of Capernaum. It's probable that he's in the home of Simon and Andrew. And uh, by this time, um, Joseph, his, uh, his mother's husband, has more than likely been dead for several years. The last time Joseph is mentioned in Scripture is when Jesus was 12 years old. Jesus is now 30 years old, and he's now performing his ministry. So his family now consists of his mother Mary, and I want you to notice this, his half-brothers, and he also has unnamed sisters. Now, when it says here in verse 20, it was told him by some who said, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. You might find this interesting, but the brothers of Jesus are mentioned by name in the gospel. Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 55 and 56 actually give us the names of Jesus' half-brothers. These brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ were born of Mary and Joseph in a natural way, Jesus obviously being the Son of God. So these are his half-brothers. And according to Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 and 56, the question is asked, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joses, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? 
And so the Lord Jesus Christ had brothers. And what is remarkable to me, as well as unnamed sisters, and what is remarkable to me is when you study the Bible and you look in John's Gospel, chapter 7, John makes it very clear that even his brothers did not believe in him. And so to me, that's an amazing thing, that they could grow up in the same home with the Son of God, an absolutely perfect being, and not embrace him in faith. I mean, imagine that for just a moment. How would you like to grow up with a perfect person? Some of you probably would say, well, I already did. That's how my mom used to treat my sister, like she was perfect. But in reality, how would you like to live in the same home with a perfect person? And that's what they did. They grew up with Jesus Christ. Jesus never did anything wrong. He never spoke back to his mom. He always was home on time. He never did a single thing wrong. He didn't get upset about anything. And when his mother said, make your bed, he would create a bed. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't do that. But, you know, I mean, he must have been just an amazing brother to have. And yet, the Bible tells us that even his brothers did not believe in him. And yet, he has these brothers. These brothers are mentioned by name. As I said, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And he has unnamed sisters. And so, it was told him in verse 20 uh, that your mother and your brothers are standing outside. They desire to see you. And so, they're there at the door. They're summoning him to come outside to them. Now, it would seem to me, because Jesus is ministering here, it would seem to me that they must have thought that he would immediately cease speaking. Now, obviously, your mother is extremely important. You are to show her proper respect. And it would seem that perhaps they assume that even if he's sharing, that he's going to stop doing what he's doing in order that he might go out there and meet them because they're requesting for him to come outside. It makes sense to me. And yet, he doesn't do that. He takes that as a teaching opportunity. Notice how he responds in verse 21. He answers, he says to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Now, was Jesus rejecting Mary and his brothers? No, the fact is he loved them. As, as a matter of fact, he loved them an awful lot more than they loved him. But what he was doing in his teaching is he's inviting people to be part of his true family through faith in him. And the point that, that is being made here is anybody can be a part of his family if they embrace the gospel. The Bible says in Galatians 3.26, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And so there's something more important than stopping what he's doing at that moment, and that is declaring the message of the gospel and illustrating through this experience how important it is to embrace him through faith. That's what God has called us to do. Now, at first, we would automatically believe that Jesus' family would have first priority. But true discipleship transcends family relationship. God's family is open to any who would come to him through the Son, Jesus Christ. It's been said Mary was more blessed in receiving the faith of Christ than in conceiving the flesh of Christ. Mary was blessed because she kept the Word of God, not merely because she gave birth, Mary's closeness to Jesus as a natural mother would have been little help for her salvation if she had not borne Christ in her heart. You see, we are not automatically in his family. We came into the family through obedient faith. In other words, being part of the family of God requires more than simply stating that you believe. It's demonstrated by a life that actually consists in pursuing the things of the Lord. I want you to see this in verse 21. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and what? Do it. And do it. I was reading something recently, I'm trying to recall what it was, that illustrates this. We've gotten to the point that we emphasize our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes make it seem that all you need to do is affirm certain things, agree with them. You simply agree with them intellectually. And that brings you into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ but we fail to realize that that is true, but there will always be evidence that, that I made that decision. I have encountered over the years too many people 
who, when you talk to them, will tell you, I'm a Christian, who have no evidence whatsoever, not just that one time I've met them, by the way, but over a consistent meeting with them. They, they, don't, they don't in any way, shape, or form appear to have any relationship with God and haven't for as long as I've known them. And yet when you speak to them, sometimes they'll argue with you and sometimes aggressively that they already are Christians. I am a Christian. And when you begin to ask them, oh, how do you know that you're a Christian? Well, because, and then they'll tell you their religious experience. Or they'll tell you, well, I believe in God. But the Bible makes it very clear. And I want you to see this here because that's what Jesus is saying. It's, it's a, a person who enters into the family of God is a person who not only hears the Word of God, it's a person who hears and does. In other words, you don't just simply agree, but you actually perform. In Luke, in chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, Luke writes, It happened, as he spoke these things, that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, more than that, listen, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed is the person, happy is the person, Complete is the person, whole is the person who hears the Word of God and does it. Salvation, the Greek word for being saved, can also be used in terms of being healed. When somebody was healed, they were, they were made whole. And salvation is intended by God to make you whole. Not to, not to give you this, this, you know, this sense of, um, you know, like God is a, an insurance salesman who provides life insurance and fire insurance for you, but that God is, is saying to you, I'll have a relationship with you, that you and I can have fellowship. Jesus said in John 17, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life, he said, is that you might have fellowship with God, a knowledge of God, a relationship with God. And when a person gets saved, a person can have a physical healing. Of course, I believe that God heals. The Bible teaches that he does. But not only are you made whole physically and can be made whole physically, but you are made whole emotionally. You are made whole spiritually. You are made whole as a person. You become real. You become an authentic individual. You become a real person. Kind of like when I was growing up, there was a movie that Walt Disney, a cartoon that Walt Disney had brought out. It was called Pinocchio. I, I used to call it Pinocchio, but it was Pinocchio. And Pinocchio was that little wooden boy that wanted to be alive. And what we are is we're, we're, we have the outer appearance of life, but we are spiritually not alive. You don't become alive until God produces life within you. When God created Adam, Adam being formed from the dirt, laying there in perfect beauty, was absolutely dead even though he had the appearance of life. He didn't become alive until God breathed into him the soul or the breath of life. And then he became a living being. And God intimately did that in order that he might have fellowship with God. What we are is dead men walking. We're, we're walking without the Spirit. We're walking without life. We're walking without the reality of fellowship with God. But Jesus Christ said, listen, you can have a relationship with me, but you need to not only hear what I say, you need to put into practice. And the thing that I'm saying to you is you need to be born again. That's the first thing you need to do is you need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And so you say, God, be merciful unto me. I am a sinner. I am separated from you. Yeah, I sin in thought. I, I, I sin in word. I, I sin in action. Lord, I am totally and completely in sin. That's what I am. By nature, I do those things that you disapprove of. It's not simply because I was raised in a certain way. It's, it's Lord, it's that I am a certain way. I am a man without your spirit, and therefore I need your touch. And so that's what we get in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God so loves the world that he gives his son so that we can believe and have, have everlasting life. That's what the gospel does for you, see? And it changes your life. 
Walking with Jesus Christ transforms your life. So an individual who says, oh, I've got a relationship with God, but has no evidence whatsoever, is lying to themselves. Lying to themselves. See, God is the power of the universe. And when you come into contact with him, there's going to be something that happens within you. There will be an evidence of that reality. I have a friend of mine. His name is Bill. Bill Goodrich, haven't seen him for many years, but I do remember the last time I saw him because he came and visited me at my house. He and I served in the military together. We went through basic training together and lost contact with one another, but over the years, he, he remembered where I lived, and on one occasion, he came and visited. And when he came and saw me, um, he was sitting in the front room, and we were speaking and all, and I asked him, Bill, what's going on with your life? He says, I, he says you remember how you told, him about, told me about Jesus Christ? And I said, yes, because I actually gave him the first Bible I ever had. I gave it to him, and I said, Bill, you need to get right with God, and this is the Bible. Read it and, and, and put your trust in Jesus. And so he said, do you remember? remember how you gave me the Bible? And it was years before. And I said, yes, I do. He said, let me tell you what happened. He says, I work for uh, the electric company. He's a lineman. He says, I was on top of one of these high-powered, high-voltage, um, you know, towers. He said, and I grabbed hold of a live wire. And he said, I literally blew into pieces. And he lifts his shirt and there's a hole on the side of his, right here on his right side, a hole there that had blown out. And, and then he lifts his, his pant leg and he shows me his calf. And his calf had been blown out. He was literally beside himself. <laughs> and so, I'll let you, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll wait for you. Okay. He was blown away, but as that happened, what a shock. As that happened, he said, he said, man, I was laying there smoking, smoking. He said, my body had been exploded, and I'm laying on the ground there with a hole in my side and a hole in my calf, smoking. I should have died because there were thousands of volts that went through him. He said, I should have died. He said, and do you know, he said, that encounter caused me to realize there's no guarantee for my life that I can go on another day. I do very dangerous work, he said, and it awakened me. I committed my heart to Jesus Christ. When you come into contact with power, there is an evidence. When you come into contact with the power of God, he doesn't blow you up, but he recreates you. He transforms you into the image of Jesus Christ you actually will change. Not just because you wake up in the morning and you kind of just sit around saying, okay, change me, Lord, change me, but because you hear what God has to say and you do it. You hear what he says and you do it. You know, we have very talented musicians. They didn't just walk up one day and pick up a guitar and just start doing runs. You know, they, they're not like, like these, these people who do this air guitar thing. I think, man, you know, get a real life. But they're not that way. These people practice. They practice constantly. They practice constantly so that they might perfect the skills. Now, if you do that with anything, which you have to, if you, if you practice anything constantly, it's been said practice makes perfect. Maybe not perfect, but it makes you better. If you practice a variety of things, you can get pretty good at it. You can get very, very adept at it. Well, when you're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're practicing the things of God, when you're hearing and doing, your life transforms. And so Jesus is making it very clear. Listen, you think that my mom and my brothers, because they're physically part of me, have a priority over everybody else. While I do honor my mother and I love my brothers, there's no doubt about that. Love them more than they love me. But the reality is this, if you want to be part of God's family, you need to hear the message and obey it. Because as you hear and you obey, you will be transformed, and that's what the Lord would have for all of us. Now, moving on into verse 22, it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake, and they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. 
Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, where's your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. Now, let's give this a context, and then we'll look at it. And this is, there's some, some things I want to share with you that I think will be a benefit if you listen. I think there will be a benefit to you, especially as we look at this passage. It's one of the most powerful passages in the New Testament. But let's give it a context. Jesus has been ministering nonstop. He's been traveling to various places. He's been teaching the people. Mark 1.28 tells us that his fame had spread throughout all the region around Galilee. So his desire is to leave the area in order that he might continue ministering to other people. So he and his disciples are launching out towards the eastern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. That's where they're going. But the Bible tells us in verse 23, as they sailed, he fell asleep. So Jesus is exhausted, having ministered throughout the entire day, and he's now falling asleep. So in the cool of the evening, a sudden storm strikes, violently shaking the water. The Sea of Galilee is surrounded by hills, and it's like a basin. And when you go to the Sea of Galilee, if you're on the western shore, and you look to the west towards the Mediterranean, when you're standing there on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, and you look to your left, we'll say if you're uh, looking north towards Mount Hermon, if you... Just look to the left there, to the west. Looking to the west, there is a, a mountain, small mountain range. It's called the Arbel. We've been there many times. And so what it is, it's a V-shape that is cut out of this, this mountain, low mountain range. And so the cool air uh, from the sea comes in and it blows through the cleft of the mountain, rather the warm air, and it meets the cool air that's coming from Mount Hermon. So when the warm air that comes from the Mediterranean coming through the Arbel meets the cold air that's coming from Mount Hermon there, it can create violent storms. We have been on the Sea of Galilee when storms have erupted. Nothing like this one here, but we have been there. When those things happen, they still to this day can and do happen. And what is happening is these storms are, it's almost, well, what it's like is like an earthquake uh, generated storm condition on the water with a cyclone effect above. That's what's taking place. That's what it's speaking about when it speaks concerning the wind being violent. It's very, very, very frightening. These are, these are experienced sailors, but they are absolutely frightened. So Jesus is sleeping here, even as it says, and as he's sleeping there peacefully, the boat begins to fill with water, and they know that they're in danger, they're in jeopardy. M Matthew 8, 24 says, a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves. According to Mark 4, 37, the waves beat into the ship so that it is now full. And so they're thinking they're going to sink. But Jesus is there sleeping. And so the disciples are greatly concerned about this. Obviously, notice verse 24. And so what did they do? Well, they came to him and they awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. So they come and they begin to cry out to him. Now, they're terrified as, as I would be. They're experienced fishermen, but they believe nothing can be done to save them. In other words, they think they're about to meet their maker, but they've forgotten they already have. And that's their problem. Now, I want to add something, and I want to develop something for you because I think some in this room might benefit from this insight that I want to give to you. You see, when Mark chapter 4, verse 38, speaks concerning this event, Mark adds these words. Mark 4, 38, Teacher, don't you care that we perish? Don't you care? That's one of the questions people ask of the Lord constantly. God, you see what I'm going through. You see the danger I'm in. You see the pain that I'm experiencing. You see the heartache that I have. You see the disappointment of my life. You see the need that I possess. God, I lost my job. My wife isn't faithful. My children are bad. My husband has been violent. You, you see this. You, you see my condition. You, and I cry out to you. And it seems like, like heaven is brass, your ear is deaf, you don't exist. What's going on? You see what I'm going through, but it seems to me 
that you don't care. And yet I read the Bible, and the Bible says God so loved the world. Well, God, I'm part of that world, and if you so love the world, why does it seem like you don't love me? Why does it seem that my life is going nowhere? Why do I do the best that I can to raise my kids, and, 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 and I do everything I can, and they don't even want to go to school? They cut class. They're not studying. And yet the, the, the people who live across the street who are never even around their kids, uh, the kids are doing great. They're on the honor roll. You know, my kid, my kid's barely able to read and write, doesn't want to do that. And God, I've done the best that I can to raise them. I just don't understand this. What's going on? This is typical. I mean, you see this all through the Psalms. In Psalm 10, verse 1, the question is asked, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? There are a lot of us in this room who have said that. God, in the midst of my mourning, in the time of my sorrow, the tears are just flowing from my heart and just spilling from my face, and I'm asking you for help, and it doesn't seem like you care. Why do you stand afar off? Lord, get involved. Do something. Help me. Extricate me. Do something. Psalm 13, 1, how long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? God, I'm crying out to you, and it seems like you're not even there. I, I, I'm moaning, I'm, I'm, I'm weeping, I'm in need. Psalm 44, 23 and 24, awake. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? Lord, don't you care? That's the bottom line. And I read my Bible, and I see intimacy God loves. God knows me. He knows the number of hairs on my head, and he knows the thoughts of my mind. He knows the words before they're even formed and escape my tongue. He, he knows everything about me. He knows, he knows the things that I fear and the things I have confidence in. He knows my hopes. He knows my dreams. He knows the things that would break my heart. And he allows them sometimes in my life. Why? 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 Don't you care? Listen, we all go through various things. None of us is exempt from hard times. And I've discovered something. It's through these times that the Lord draws close to us. Psalm 77, verse 6 says, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. Song in the night. God gives us songs in the night, in the midst of the darkness, in times of fear and trouble, in our times of doubt and uncertainty. Every one of us goes through darkness. Every, every one of us walks through the valley of the shadow of death. Every one of us does. Not a single one of us is exempt from that. When my father died, I... My dad died on a Thursday. On Friday, I went and bought a, a casket, bought a plot for him. On Saturday, I, I had a servant Saturday, and I came and did the servant Saturday. And I asked the question of the congregation. Perhaps some of you may have been there that, that day. And I said something like, how many of you have lost somebody that you love? Mom and dad, somebody that, that you love with all of your heart, who died. And they didn't know that my father had died, and so I asked the question. I said, how many of you know of somebody, loved somebody that died? And uh, a good number of them raised their hand. And I remember saying, I just joined your fraternity. My dad died on Thursday. And that was dark. That was pain. That was the darkest thing I'd ever experienced. It was very hard. Two years later, my, my father-in-law dies. In the same hospital room, two beds away from where my father died, I stood there with my father-in-law, who had become my dad, because my dad was gone. And I stood at his feet, and I watched him, and I watched that monitor with my brothers-in-law and my sister-in-law and my sons. As I watched my wife's father died. And I watched that monitor as the heartbeat slowed and stopped. I look in 
at the body of my father-in-law. And I looked to my left, two beds over where my dad died. Two years, almost to the day. See, my dad died February 15th. My father-in-law died February 13th. Two years almost to the day in the same ICU room. I look over there. You know, before he died, he was in a coma, and I approached him and stood next to him, and I touched him, Marie and I. And I said, I said, Pop, I want to say two things to you that I've never told you. And I remember touching him as he was just there quietly laying, and I said, I want to tell you two things that I've never told you. I said, I want to, one, I want to tell you I love you. I never told you. And two, I want to tell you thank you for the way you raised your daughter, my wife. Thank you. You go through darkness. You go through pain. You go through suffering. You go through sorrow. And you can sometimes say, don't you care? Lord, I cry to you. How come the evil seemed to get away with everything? You see, my father-in-law was a good man. My dad was a good man. And they, were, they died early. And yet, God, I have to be honest. I, I see, you know, this 90-year-old man that I know. He was actually 96 years old. He was a molester. He was an evil man. And he lives 96 years. Why do the good die young? Lord, my dad never got to hold my, my grandson. I wanted him to. He didn't attend his granddaughter's wedding and was missed. Why? Anybody know what I'm saying or am I talking to myself? Why? Why, Lord? Why? Listen. Lord, don't you care is the worst question you can ask because he does care. He does. It's just our circumstances surrounding us can draw our attention to the point of failing to remember his promises. God gives us songs in the night in the night seasons, because as we go through night seasons, we are caused to draw closer to him, that we might learn that he never leaves us, that he never forsakes us. And Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so as they're crying out, notice verse 24, what he does. He arose and he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. So he did respond to their request. He did rise up and do something. And the disciples are now learning a tremendous lesson. They're going to learn something. God is aware of their every need, and he doesn't leave them nor forsake them. Psalm 18, 6 says, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. And so Jesus rebukes the wind, the raging of the water. Notice immediately the wind ceases. There's a great calm. And so Jesus reveals to us that we worship a God who acts on our behalf. He's not distant from us. He's personal. He's alive, and he helps us in times of trouble. He's the master over creation. He speaks the word, and nature responds. Psalm 89, verse 9 says, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. In Psalm 107, 29 and 30, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they're glad because they're quiet. He guides them to their desired haven. And so the Lord Jesus Christ does that work. He responds. Now notice verse 25. He actually turns and He says, Where is your faith? Why are you fearful? Why are you faithless? Now, you might ask yourself this question, to be honest with you. You might not understand why he's confrontational. You might ask, why? Why are you being confrontational? Well, I want to give you a couple things here. One, well, Jesus actually sent them into the storm. There's nothing secret from him. He knew that. He sent them into the storm. Storms and times of uncertainty actually are used by the Lord to teach us to trust him. And each person who trusts in the Lord goes through storms. That will test in every way. 
Why was he confrontational? Why did he question their faith? Well, the answer's already been supplied. I want you to see this in verse 22. I want you to see it again. Why is he saying, why did you doubt? Why did you have no faith? Well, verse 22, it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, what did he say? Let us go over to the other side of the lake. What are you saying, Jesus? I'm saying we're going to get to the other side. My order was, let's go to the other side. I've already told you we're going to make it. I said, let us go. I intend to make it through the entire journey, and you will too. And as long as you're with me, you're safe. That's why he could sleep. He was going to make it, and so were they. In Isaiah 41.10, it says, Fear not, I'm with you. Be not dismayed, I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He said, let us go over to the other side of the lake. Therefore, you will make it to the other side of the lake. That's just the way it is. That's why when we go through the things that we go through, he will never leave me, nor will he forsake me. I am an overcomer. I am victorious. I will make it through. There's nothing that will keep me from that. He began a good work, will continue it, and will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. I have a sure assurance of God's presence with me, and therefore, no matter where I am, he's there with me. I will make it through. And that's what he was teaching them. Why do you have no faith? I told you we're going to make it through. You know what? I told you we're going to get there on the other side. Where is your faith? But what is their response? Verse 25, they're afraid. They marvel. And look what they say to one another. Who can this be? He commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. You see, when we're in Israel, this happens almost every time. We're on the Sea of Galilee. We will stop, and we'll just sit there in the water in that little boat, and one of our guides inevitably will say, who wants to take a walk. Because they know the passage that we're about to teach. Who wants to take a walk? None of us, of course, do. Rawl tried once. We're still searching for him. <laughs> but what they're doing here is they're afraid, but this time it's not afraid of death. This time it's a holy fear. Who is this man? One brief thought. If there's anything that the body of Christ has lost, it's the fear of God. We have domesticated Jesus so that he's almost like just a buddy or a chum or somebody that we hang around with. And we have lost the fear of God. And the sad thing is that when you have no fear of God, then you'll do absolutely anything you feel like doing. Because the fear of God is to depart from evil. But when people do not have the fear of God, they'll do basically anything. And I can't tell you, and I'm not going to go on with this too long other than to say this. I was talking to somebody just recently about this, a younger person whom I happen to love very much, and we were speaking on this issue. And I said, the thing that concerns me is the church doesn't have a holy reverence for God, the body of Christ doesn't have a holy reverence for God, a fear of the Lord. We have made God domesticated. You know, C.S. Lewis speaking concerning the, the lion that represents Jesus Christ, uh, he's called Aslan in his writings. Uh, he says, Aslan is not a tame lion, but we have tamed Jesus to make him kind of like uh, somebody that we just kind of hang around with. But if we feel like doing something that we know is wrong, he understands. His grace is sufficient. It's no big deal. He knows I'm weak and I've got flesh, and we make excuses. Uh, I've been praying for myself that God will resurrect and reignite a fear of God in my heart for him because he's holy and he's righteous. And when you encounter him, you have the same kind of question. Who is this? Who can this be? Who is this man really? Well, the answer, he's the Lord of the earth and the Lord of the sea. Psalm 89, 8 and 9. O Lord, God of hosts, who's mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Who is this? 
This is God in human flesh. That's who it is, the one who commands winds and water. But it is easier for him to get the wind and the water to obey him than it is for him to get us to obey him because we have a will that resists him. And that's why we need to cling to him and to say, God, break me where it's necessary that I might live a life that pleases you. Bottom line, with Jesus in the midst, there's never anything to fear. With Jesus, there's really nothing to fear. Jesus said, listen, he goes, do not fear the one who has the body, uh, has the power to kill the body. He says, and after that can do nothing. So if you want to have fear, fear the one who's able to kill and then to cast you into hell. If you want to fear, fear him. And when you make choices who to be afraid of, in other words, who to reverence, rather than being afraid of losing your life because you close your eyes here and you open them in heaven, rather than being afraid of losing your physical life here, you need to be afraid of the one who has power to make judgment for you to enter into the kingdom or not. If you fear the Lord, you depart from evil. It's the beginning of knowledge, and you'll walk in such a way that's pleasing to him. A holy reverence, an awareness of his great power. You know, my kids don't fear me as an evil man because I'm not towards them. If there's anything daddy's been is maybe it's too soft. I love them to pieces. But they know that you can go just to a certain point and then you've reached the limit. You know exactly what I'm saying. Just yesterday, my daughter Anna and I talking. I don't think she'd mind me saying this. She said something to me, and I know she was playing with me. But I said, what did you say? And she looked at me and goes, ah, because they know you get to... <laughs> That's a thin line, but you need to be very careful not to cross over it. With my father, I could play with my dad. I was the one kid who could. I could tease my dad, and I could make him laugh like nobody else. But I knew that I could only approach this far and not go any further because I knew my restrictions. Was my dad, did he love me? Absolutely. Was I afraid of him? I respected and reverenced him, and I wanted to please him. If I was that way as a man with my father, and he's a human being, I want to be more so for my God, not to take advantage of his goodness towards me and to trust him, to love him, but to reverence him because he's God and I'm not.